But I do want to get down to the brass tacks. How are we picking these senators? Um, so what we did, it would be a nationally elected. So you would vote for them in the same way that you would vote in a presidential election. Now, everybody votes on the same day, right? So it would just be on your ballot. Um, we've said we'll vote for them uh, every two years. And then really at the recommendation from a lot of good government people in Washington, um, we decided to do it through a system of ranked choice voting, which has been proven to be very effective in places like Maine, where you would vote for your first choice and your second choice and your third choice. Voters just saw what happened in Alaska that did that, that Mary Peltola came in, who was a um, much more moderate centrist person than the people running at the extremes. But everybody said, this is kind of who I want. And in a ranked choice voting system, you get that. So what we've said is let's elect these senators on a ranked choice basis. Um, uh, but other than that, would be elected in the same way as any other senator. And this would be an amendment to the Constitution. So as of now, as we're sitting here, this is not constitutional? Yes, we would have to add that um, any expansion in the any expansion of the Senate would have to be an amendment to the Constitution in this fact, because the Constitution only contemplates that every state has two senators. There's no protocol within the Constitution to expand the numbers. The proposal we've introduced to expand the House, by contrast, doesn't require a constitutional amendment because the the House has always grown as population grows. As states have moved around, there's no magic number that each state will only get a certain number of members. So we were able to introduce a separate piece of legislation to expand the House without a constitutional amendment. But on the Senate, it would take an amendment. And let's talk about the House piece of this legislation. How many members would you be adding to the House of Representatives? So what we've done on the House side is really just to change the math. Right now, every time we do the census, so every 10 years, the one we just got through in 2020, we redivide the population of America by 435, which is the number of seats in the House. And that sets the number of districts that every, the number of constituents every member of the House represents. We don't have to do it that way. You could imagine a different piece of math that said, let's make sure that every House member continues to represent the same number of people and increase the number of members in the House, right? What we've done here is to say, at the next census in 2030, let's look at the population of the smallest state in the country and set that state to be the size of a congressional district. Right now, I represent 730,000 people, roughly. And remember what I said before, there's only 570,000 people in the state of Wyoming, which means that that a, a person from Wyoming has greater representation in the House of Representatives than someone who lives in the 6th Congressional District of Illinois, because proportionally there's, you know, there's more representation per person. And so what I've done is say, let's set the smallest state to be the size of a district. If we had done that in, in the last census, that would have added about 130 seats to the House um, on 435. So it's, you know, it's it's significant, but it doesn't break the institution. And and again, keep in mind that the, la the last time the House was expanded was in 1920. Uh, Our population was was so much smaller than that if I was in my seat then I only would have represented about 200,000 people. So this is a this is this is not going back to what we were before the last time the house was expanded but I think is a directional corrective. So you're saying this will, you know, level the playing field? It would make the body that much more representative because we'd have more representatives representing and proportionately fewer people. It would make it more likely that when people like me go home to our districts, we run into our constituents, right? Just because you have fewer constituents. It would make the House much more diverse in almost every measure because, you know, as a as a body that is much, much older, much wider, much more male than the population, and given the power of incumbency, creating a cadre of new people would necessarily make it more diverse. And so if we're more diverse, if we are closer to our constituents, it's going to make the House more representative. The other thing it would do, and this is important, along with the Senate bill, the number of electors in the Electoral College is the number of members of the House plus the number of members of the Senate. So by expanding the number of electors and by making congressional districts smaller, it reduces the range of scenarios where the winner of the, of the popular vote in a presidential election um, would lose the electoral vote. There's only four times in our history that that's happened. Two of them have been in the last 23 years. And that's a function of the fact that because the population has grown so much faster than the House, which is the number of electors, it's, it's created a situation which is untenable. And I think as those of us who have lived through the last 23 years know, 
it's a there are some legitimacy problems you run into as a president when you lose the popular vote that limits your ability to get things done. So the idea is it would make our, our presidency more effective as